Hey, g'day, it's Prezo. Welcome back to my workshop. Now I've got a new sticker to go up in the door today and I'm going to have a look at a project on the bench over here. It's part two of building a set of low profile Mighty Bite like knockoff clamps. So I've got some interesting materials to work with and some new processes, but let's do the sticker first. Now today's sticker comes all the way from Tennessee in the United States and it belongs to Ed Kud. C-U-D-E. I hope I got that pronunciation correct. And you'll find him on YouTube as EC Workshop. Now Ed's channel is all about machine shop work. He was a machinist uh, quite a long time in his working career. But now he's retired. He's seriously into hunting and fishing and workshop projects. He's got a stack of videos up there on YouTube. And if you into those things in hunting and fishing, You'll love his content, so check him out. Uh, there he is there, SGTCUDE59. Thanks, Ed. This is sort of where I got to in the last video. So what I was doing was making up a set of either stops or clamps to go on a pallet or a fixture plate which I can attach to my rotary table. And these are modeled along the same lines as the Mighty Bite style clamps. I first saw this on uh, Clickspring's channel and he had made a couple of different styles of clamps but they all have this feature where there's an eccentric headed screw and when you rotate that screw it drives a clamping element laterally so it can move that clamping element in against the side of a piece of stock and this style of clamp is set on a 10 degree angle so it also uh, supplies some downward clamping force as well. And with these stepped uh, stops and clamps, what you can do is put a piece of material in there and then clamp it and hold it up off the surface of the fixture plate or the pallet. Now there is another style where you can clamp the stock directly against the fixture plate and I'll show you those later on. In today's video I want to go ahead and make these eccentric headed screws and these brass clamping elements or fingers or jaws, whatever you like to call them. And I also want to make a set of hardened steel uh, jaws or fingers or clamping elements. <laughs> and they will be the same shape as this brass one here, but made of a grade of steel that I can harden in the home workshop. Now I've also been experimenting with this style of clamp here. Now this is just one that I came up with. I don't know if there's something commercially available that does the same job. And it has a 90 degree sharp edge which can bite into softer materials like brass, aluminium, plastics and so on. So you can substitute or swap out the screw. Let's just take this one out. And I've only made the one of these eccentric headed screws so far. This was just a prototype to get the process dialed in. But you can put that one in there. And now you can clamp against those softer materials. Uh, let's just see if it'll do this brass. So as you tighten that, it'll bite into the brass. And it resists any upward uh, movement. If you were to drill brass and the drill bit catches, it will try to pull the stock up the surface of the drill. It'll actually wind it up the helix. This style of clamp here, because of the way it bites into the side of the stock, is going to stop that from happening. Now, this is made of 4140 steel. I'm not sure how readily this will harden. I'll give it a go and see how we get on. But to be really effective, this needs to be hardened steel. Now, the, um, the other type of jaw that I'd be making, which is a replica of this brass one here, I want to make that from a hardenable steel and I have this big chunk of steel bar stock. Now this is part of a machine that was given to me by one of my viewers. It uh, was part of a hydraulic ram unit and these are sort of like the slide uh, for the hydraulic ram unit and this is uh, hardened steel. I can't cut this, so I can't machine it, but if I can anneal this I'll be able to use that to make parts for these clamps and a few other projects around the place. So I'm going to have a go at um, annealing that and we'll see if we can get it to the state where we can machine it and then re-harden it later. Okay, so I think we're going to do that first. Let's have a look at annealing that stock and see how we get on. Well, I'm just putting the stock in the vise here and I'm going to try and cut this with a file just to demonstrate how hard it actually is. 
So you can see here the file is just skating over that surface and there's no way that's going to cut with any of the machine tools that I have. So we really need to go and anneal this, so I'm going to do that in my foundry furnace. So before I can get that in the furnace I need to cut this up into smaller pieces. So I'm actually cutting through the centres of the drill holes there to give me manageable pieces of stock that I can use. I'm going to stack these in the bottom of the foundry furnace and we're going to close the lid and heat this up and we need to get it up to a sort of a medium red heat. The correct term for the point at which the steel changes its structure is called the point of recalescence. This is also the point where the steel becomes non-magnetic. I can't test that inside the foundry or inside the furnace but what I can do is just observe the colour. When I get that really nice and red hot I'm just going to turn the gas off, put a brick on top of the uh, furnace so it cools down very slowly. So let's check back in about uh, four hours and see whether it's cool enough to take out. Now it's still quite warm in there. Let's go and see if that's soft. Turned the heat off on this about uh, four hours ago. It's been sitting in the kiln or the furnace ever since. Let's just see if we can hit this with a file. Well, that's cutting. So you can see the notch there that I was able to cut in there with the file. So this is soft enough to machine now. Happy days. So I think the first step in today's video is to make these eccentric headed screws. Now I bought a set of what's called low head M8 socket head screws. So here's the packet. So you can see there it says low head uh, M8 by 12. If you're dealing with imperial dimensions that's close enough to 5 sixteenths of an inch. Now I got these from a company here in Australia called Bolt and Nut Australia. They're not a sponsor uh, but I'm really happy with their service. They can uh, supply just about any fastener very very quickly. And if I hold one of these low head screws up against a regular M8 socket head screw you can see the difference in the height of the head. And if I put the screw directly into that brass jaw there you can see that it's almost a snug fit against what is really a 14 millimeter counterbore in that brass jaw there. Once we turn this and made it eccentric we're going to need to add a sleeve to it to bring it back up to a dimension that's a fairly snug fit in that counterbore. So in fact this one has already had that sleeve put on it and you can see it's a very close fit and it's that motion, that rotary motion that drives the jaw in and out against the side of the stock that you want to clamp. So there's actually a total of one millimeter offset in that eccentric. So that's the only motion that you're going to get is a full one millimeter for a complete half turn of the screw. But that's generally enough to clamp the parts that I'm doing anyway. So let's head over to the lathe and let's modify one of these and then we'll, uh, we'll move on and make these brass elements. In order to turn the heads of these screws eccentric I need to make up a mandrel threaded M8 so I can drive these screws in then we're going to offset the mandrel in the four jaw chuck to give us the eccentric throw. In the video I watched where Clickspring made these, he used a steel mandrel. Now I'm worried that when I go to soft solder this little sleeve over the head of the screw once we've reduced it and made it eccentric, uh, that soft soldering process may be an issue with a steel mandrel. I think that there's a high potential to get soft solder smeared everywhere and end up soldering the screw into the mandrel itself. So I'm using 20 millimeter aluminium bar stock and uh, I can heat that and work with it and, and there's really no problem with getting solder penetrating into the thread in this mandrel and sticking the screw in there. So I'm going to go ahead and get this part made. I'll also make up a whole bunch of these little sleeves. These are made of just mild steel and I'll have them ready when we go to do the, the actual soldering process. But let's get this done first.
All right, that's our mandrel done, and the head of the screw can butt up against the end of the mandrel quite tightly because of that big countersink I put on there. So I'm going to take this out now. We'll make all the, the little sleeves that go over the head of the screw, and then we'll come back and do the eccentric turning. Now, if you're wondering why I'm using hex bar stock to make what is essentially a round sleeve, the answer is that this is a really nice free-cutting mild steel. All of the other round bar stock that I have is pretty horrible. It's a what they call a cold bending steel. It doesn't machine very well, it's difficult to part off, and it doesn't leave a very good finish. I've got a lot of this hex bar stock, uh, so I'm just going to use that. This now needs to be drilled and reamed to 11 millimeters. Now, I chose 11 millimeters because I had a ream of that size and also it's sort of convenient size once you turn down the head of the screw to make it eccentric. You don't want to make it too small and uh, it just cleans up at that 11 millimeter dimension. Now, the only problem is I don't have a 10.9 millimeter drill bit. So I'm gonna drill 10.5 and then I'll bore it out close to 11 and then we'll ream it. A bit inconvenient, but that's what we gotta do. The, uh, the old rear parting tool is going really, really well. Uh, it's a, a huge time saver and big relief to be able to do this with automatic feed. So I've got four of those done there, plus the one prototype screw that I already made. I'll do the rest off camera, and then we'll have a go at turning the heads of the screws. I put that aluminium mandrel back in the four jaw chuck, and I've dialed in the head of one of the screws as close as I can get it. And what I'll do now is machine the surface of the mandrel while it's centered. And that will give me a machine surface to run the indicator on. And we're going to offset the mandrel one millimeter total. Okay, so I'm going to pick a jaw, in this case jaw number one and we're going to move the entire mandrel across by half a millimeter giving us one millimeter total run out and then we can go ahead and machine all of the heads of the screws and put the sleeves on so um, now I need to loosen jaw number three okay let's zero the indicator and we need to go across a half a millimeter Alright, that's pretty good there. The exact dimension here isn't really all that critical. Uh, we just want to get a around about one millimeter total offset. But I'll work on that, we'll get it right. Okay, and that's within two hundredths of a millimeter, that's close enough. So what I need to do now is machine down the head of the screw and the mandrel, and we need to keep going until our little steel sleeve here is a sort of a running fit. Uh, we need to leave a little bit of clearance for the soft solder to go in. Uh, 
Now I'm going to leave a little bit of a shoulder on the aluminium uh, mandrel here so that when I press the sleeve on or push the sleeve on it won't go past the bottom of the screw and I can soft solder that on and leave the bottom of the head uh, pretty much flush with the ring. Alright, that's pretty good there. Um, I don't think that needs much more clearance, so I think I'll just hit that with some emery cloth just to polish it up a bit and remove some of the mess that's on there, cutting oil and that sort of thing. I will have to clean everything with acetone before we try and solder it, uh, and that's the next step. The only thing I don't like about this process is that you have to use an acid flux to get a good bond with the solder. I know you can buy like paste fluxes and rosin fluxes and so on, but in my view an acid flux is going to give you a much better bond. So I have covered up the bed of the lathe, I've moved the carriage right down the other end of the lathe so I don't get acid fumes anywhere near those bright steel surfaces. And I've got a very small amount of acid flux in this plastic cup here, and we're just going to go around and wet that and then we're going to put a gas flame on there and get a coating of solder on that so we're basically going to tin that and then push the sleeve on and reheat it Alright, so we've got a solder film on that now, so I'm just going to clean the little ring, get some acid flux inside that, and then we'll reheat everything and push the ring on. Okay, uh, that was exciting. I had it sort of cocked sideways a bit and I went on with a bit of a rush and uh, splattered me with uh, hot solder. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to let that cool a bit and then we're just going to trim the head off and then bring the outside diameter so it's a nice snug fit in our brass jaw. So this should fit this 14mm counterbore, and that's good. 
So I'll just do a little bit of chamfering and that can come out of there. Alright, so that's one and I've got about another nine to go. I'll do all those off camera and we'll come back and we'll look at the, the brass parts. Now there's all ten of those eccentric headed screws now. They're sitting in that cup full of WD-40 because I noticed they were starting to corrode. The, uh, that acidic soldering flux is going to attack steel even though you wash it and clean it and everything. So they'll just sit in some WD-40 until I'm ready to use them. Now I also found out you can harden this uh, 4140 steel. So I'm going to make another one of these round jaws. This one's been hardened and tempered. And I've got some stock cut up here now to make the brass jaws. So each one of those pieces will make two of these jaws. So we'll go ahead and make a batch of those and we're going to have a go at making the steel ones as well. I've got this brass stock sitting on its edge in the vise and I need to reduce this down to 19 millimeters thickness. I'll do that for four of these pieces to give me eight jaws and then we'll set up some steel stock and do the same thing. So that second clean up pass on the other side should bring this to 19. There you go. Isn't it great when that happens? Especially on camera. So with these steel parts I'm going to do the same thing. We're just going to reduce the width of these down to 19 millimeters, uh, machining both sides. And then I'll side mill the end of each piece just to give me a reference surface for the next step which is drilling the holes and doing the counter bores. Before I do mill the other features in these parts I need to bring the thickness down to 6.5, it's 10 at the moment, so we'll do that and then we'll square up the ends. That's one of the steel parts done.
I've got all my stock size now and what I need to do is to drill and counterbore for those eccentric headed screws so I'll end up with something like that. So this is sitting on a pair of sacrificial aluminium parallels and I've got my end stop set up here so I'm going to centre find the part and offset from that machined end. Now later on that end that I side milled is going to get cut off at an 80 degree angle. So I'm going to allow a little bit of clearance on that end there. The actual dimension to the centre of the hole from the finished edge of the jaw is 9.5 but I'm going to come in 9.8 and we'll go ahead and I'm just going to plunge a 10 millimetre end mill through the part and then we're going to do the counter bore with a 14 millimetre slot drill. So let's find the centre now and get all set up. So this is my 14 millimeter slot drill and that's going to form the counter bore and all I've done is I've bored the cutter down against the surface of the stock and zeroed Z on the DRO. Now I'm going to do the cut by bringing the knee up because in brass it's a bit uh, dicey when you're using the quill to feed the cutter in, it can grab. So uh, with the knee you've got a bit more control. Right, that went really cleanly, uh, so what we're going to do now is flip this part around, do the same on the other end, get all the parts processed that way, split them in half and then we'll make up a fixture to do the 80 degree angle on either end. The steel ones are a lot easier to machine, or nicer to machine anyway, than the brass ones. Now these pairs of jaws are finished, I'm going to take these in next door and cut these in half on my little bandsaw. And then each of the square jaws, or roughly square jaws, will need to have opposing edges machined to an 80 degree angle, measured from the bottom of the jaw. So in order to make that easy, I've made up this little fixture here. So it's set in the vise now at 10 degrees, but I machined it while it was sitting in the vise level. And I put a pocket in the back corner there. That's 19 by 19, and I've relieved the corner, and it's got an M8 threaded hole right in the center. So what we can do is put each of the, the little square jaws, or roughly square jaws, into that pocket, and then machine those opposing edges to that, that bevel angle. And then while it's still in the same fixture, I can put the grooves in. So what I'll do is have one edge with grooves and the other edge just plain. And uh, yeah, we'll do that to both the steel and the brass ones. I already machined this jaw to be perfectly square. So it's 19 millimeters on all the edges. And what I'll do is I'll just put some Sharpie on that brass surface there. And then I'm going to machine the bevel until that Sharpie mark just disappears. That's going to give me a sharp edge at the bottom. So I'll get this one set up. And once I do get this set, I can zero out the x-axis on my DRO and just do them all to the same setting. 
I just want to make sure that it's pushed right into that corner. Okay, I can go ahead and start machining that now. I'm just going to have to watch that mark really carefully. All right, I'm calling that close enough. There's no point in putting a razor sharp edge on it because it'll just burr over. So I'm gonna zero out X and then we'll just flip this part around, do the same thing on the other end and then just cycle them all through. Well, there's the first one done. I'll cycle all these parts through now, the same operations, but they need to go back in that same fixture to cut the grooves in one of these edges. Right, this is the last operation I'm going to do in today's video anyway. I know I said I was going to get to the parkerising, but I'm not going to. <laughs> That's going to be part three. We'll also do the hardening and tempering of the steel jaws. So the way I'm going to do this is, and, and what I'm actually doing, is I'm cutting the V grooves in one face of each of these jaws. So I've got a 90 degree double angle cutter, and I've moved the fixture out a little bit further to the edge of the vise so I can get at it without crashing the bottom of the arbor into the vise. So I'm going to mount the parts in the same way, and then we're going to just run three passes with this double angle cutter. Now I drew this out in CAD, and that's what I got in the CAD drawing, and when I stuck to those dimensions on the first part, I wasn't happy with it. So it's, you know, always a case you draw things in CAD, it looks good, but in practice, you know, it sometimes doesn't work out. So when I did the first one, which is this one here, I don't know if you can see that, but the bottom, the very bottom groove is not, uh, well, it's too close to the bottom of the jaw, really. And also the, the bottom of the V broke into the counter bore. Now this was just a scrap part that I made early on and it's not exactly the same dimensions as all of the other parts but just the same I thought I could probably tweak those dimensions to get a better result. So this is the second one. So this is an actual part that I'm going to use and I think you can see that that groove pattern there is much more uniform. So I didn't go quite as deep, I uh, only went 0.8 of a millimetre instead of 1.03 and I brought the top groove up a little bit closer toward the top of the jaw. So I've set all those dimensions to the DRO, so I'm just going to go ahead and do all of the parts. Now I'll just do one brass one and one steel one. The other thing I was looking for here is I didn't want to have too much of a sharp point on each of the jaws or each of the grooves. Uh, if that was too sharp, it's just going to crush anyway. I'm guessing these brass jaws are more for softer materials like plastics and aluminium. On harder materials, you'd probably want to use the hardened steel jaws. And I'm only going to do one face of each jaw. So I'll leave that one plain. And that way you have a choice. You can use either one. So I'm going to get set up now. We'll run a steel one, a brass one, and then we'll wind up. All right, it's going to be super awkward. This is the best view that I can give you on the camera, but it also places the camera right in front of the machine. And uh, I can't easily get at the Y-axis handle or the Z-axis handle, so I'm just going to reach in, do the best I can there. Uh, but this will give you a better view of each pass of that double angle cutter. All right, let's see how we go.
Okay, well, I think that one okay. I'll do a steel one and then we'll finish up for today. So on my DRO, I've just got to come up to zero, which will be the top groove, and then it's 2.15 Z direction for each pass, and we do that twice. Alright, so there's a steel one, so it's going to do them all like that, I hope. <laughs> but just to finish up today, I thought I'd show you some ways that you might use these clamps and stops. Now remember, this fixture plate gets bolted down to the rotary table, and my rotary table. Uh, if you've got something similar, you can either hold this in the vise or bolt it directly down to the table of your milling machine or the cross side of your lathe. And this set of clamps and stops here is set up so that we can put a part down directly on the surface of the fixture plate. So that's resting on the aluminium plate there. And when we lock that eccentric headed screw, that's going to push that part down and hold it quite firmly against the table. So that's the first way you might use it. In this setup here, we can hold the material up off the surface of the fixture plate or the pallet. So this is some plastic material and that's just sitting in the stops there, sitting up in the, uh, the gap. And we can lock that. And that, I can bend that plastic, but you know, I really can't rip it out of there. I guess I could if I really tried. But you'd have to imagine that we've got you know, really more than one pair of these. There'd be another pair up here to hold this really firmly. Now, if I unlock that, you can see the grooves caused by those steel jaws. So that indicates that they're biting in quite firmly against the surface there. And that's going to happen if you're using aluminium or brass or plastics, for example, like this stuff here. On steel, it's going to bite in to a certain extent. And don't forget, these are going to get hardened later on. Now, when I was making these, and I showed you a pair of these being done, the brass and the steel ones, I had a look at the steel one uh, off camera and I was really disappointed. It was, it was awful actually. <laughs> uh, what had happened was when I did the first brass one, a little burr got kicked up on this corner here and it was pushing the part out of alignment. I couldn't see it, camera was in the way. And when I did this first steel part and I saw how bad it was, I went looking for the answer and that was it. So I just nicked the corner off that with a file and then when I put the remaining parts in there and cut them with that double angle cutter, they, they came out perfect. So there's a good set, and I'll show you the crook one. Yeah, that's it there. So the depth of the V isn't uniform across the, the face of the clamp there. It'll still work, but it would be nice if it come out with a, you know, a nice crisp definition along that V there. All right, now, um, I thought I'd show you this too. Now, this was sent to me by a viewer named Alan. This is um, a digital file that he sent me. It was an STEP file, and I've turned that into an STL and printed that. Now, that's uh, PETG filament printed with 25% infill, and I tried it out on the pallet, and it does work. Now, obviously, you can't clamp it down as hard as you would a, a metal clamp or stop, and the screws that I have don't reach all the way into that standard M8 nut. So I couldn't really test it out uh, using the eccentric headed screws that I'd made. So why would you make a 3D printed one? Well maybe you don't own a milling machine or a lathe and if you have a CNC router this would probably be perfect. 
it's going to be enough to hold down wooden or plastic parts or even aluminium parts maybe. And if you run a CNC router bit into one of these, you're not going to damage your machine or damage the cutter as much as you would if you ran it into a steel part like this. So I just thought I'd show you that, and thanks Alan for sending that. It's sort of another option for viewers uh, if you want to make clamps of this type. Now, um, unfortunately, I, like I said, I'm not going to get time to do the park rising today. When we come back in the next episode, I'm going to do the hardening and tempering of the steel parts. We'll do the parkerizing, and I've got an idea for another one of these circular type of clamps. So instead of having just the one sharp edge on it, I'm going to make a threaded uh, bush, if you like. So it'll have three, maybe, points of engagement up the vertical face of that clamp there. So I'll make a couple of those, and we'll harden and temper them as well and try them out. And I'm going to... Um, get to work on my Hemingway knurling tool and I'll show you a couple of parts like this one here I'll put these on the rotary table on the pallet with these clamps and I'll just show you how that might work out so that's all coming up in the next episode uh, this has gone on a bit too long today unfortunately but join me next time there's going to be some interesting stuff to do and see and uh, I'll catch you on that video and it's Prezzo signing out cheers Tammy the turkey's been hanging out with their chickens again. I had to put finer mesh on the mobile chook pen because Tammy was helping us help with the food and the water. She just stuck her head through the wire and when she was uh, going through a period of nesting or at least laying eggs she became really aggressive and was pulling on the combs of the chickens making them bleed. But she seems to have chilled out a bit. Um, <laughs> most days she just sort of hangs out with the chickens and seems to enjoy the company for now.